welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today on the show, we have John Bloom. He is an anesthesiologist and a healthcare executive. He wrote the Kevin MD article, Diabetes Impacts the Whole Body, but the Foot Can't Be Forgotten. John, welcome to the show. Excited to be here. Thank you for having me. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today? Sure. Well, th this is normally a good, you know, three, four hour podcast that I would get into here, but I'll, I'll try to give it the quick version, which is, yeah, I, I went into medicine really because of having amazing people around me who were physicians and how inspiring it was. I just was working at the Costco one hour photo lab and one of the people who was coming in, I got to know was a cardiothoracic surgeon. He let me scrub in with him. And what, what a miraculous human he was, what a miraculous thing he was doing. It was just so inspiring. And that was it. I changed to pre-med, went there, really got fascinated by technology. We, we did a lot of work it was at University of Pittsburgh to try to overhaul the, the tech infrastructure that helps do medical education. I found that I really enjoyed sort of projects and thinking about tech, although again, I'm, I'm not a technician. I have no engineering background, probably way too big for my britches and most of the things that I was getting myself into. I fell in love with anesthesia. There was something beautiful about the science, about the care, you know, holding this patient's hand in this moment and trying to get them through a, a scary time. And it was weird because I came in knowing I was going to be a surgeon. I came out an anesthesiologist that, that not being right, that it's going to come up a few times in my career. And then went to Mass General to, to try to learn this, this field. And Mass General was an interesting place. The, the reason why I really wanted to go there is it had a collection of these people who were doing crazy things, not mm -hmm. just being in the OR or not just, you know, in, in the internal medicine. So throughout the entire hospital, there were these clinicians that wanted to you know, change the world and they were doing creative things. And I, I found that so inspiring. To try to close up this story quickly, what I'll say is I met a couple of these innovators and um, they wanted to throw me into some of the companies they were developing. And I mm -hmm. just, I couldn't even speak their language. They wanted me to work on marketing. And I mm -hmm. embarrassingly didn't actually know what that meant. I still, still sometimes struggle to really know what it means. And he was the first person who said, maybe you should check out business school. That might be an interesting way to try to learn this language that's here. The 08 crash hit. No one was doing elective cases. And so it was kind of an interesting time to think about what might I do, given that there were not that many anesthesia jobs opening up. One of my attendees was the chief medical officer of Covidian, and he ultimately hired me out to be his global medical director to work on monitoring technologies. And this was really now my first step out of, out of practice into an industry role, thinking about monitoring technologies. Worked for three months at the University of Pittsburgh with the goal of then starting business school and doing cases on the weekend. But as soon as I came into the business school world, it just, everything started to click. And then by month three, we founded the company that I still work at today. That's 10 years ago now. And it just sort of took off from there. So during that 10 year journey from clinical medicine into the CEO of a technology company role, tell me some of the challenges that you faced in making that journey. Well, I, I think the the one, and especially as I talk to other clinicians who are thinking about doing, in many ways, medicine is one of the safest careers you can do. If you work hard, you can get the scores, mm -hmm. you have the ability to get into a medical school. It's a very safe spot. You're going to make a good salary. You're going to, you know, for the most part, have a, a place that you're going to work at for probably the rest of your career. So for the, the amount of risk tolerance you need to jump out of something so safe, and you often have this med school debt. Mm -hmm. You still got to pay off. Like it's, you really need to stay there to jump into something like this, that we don't pay ourselves anything. They're going to start to do a startup. That's, that's a lot to deal with. So it was back to eating top ramen noodles, mm -hmm. Campbell's soup. I mean, all the worst things I could do for salt. I can only imagine what kind of salt loads I was taking. And, and that was tough. It was tough knowing that I could have popped out any minute and got a great job. You know, I, 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 Pittsburgh would, would pull me in. That was probably the toughest thing is just once you realize that this is what you, you have to do for your career, you have to do this, then you got to figure out how to make it work. And it doesn't always pay well in the beginning to try to, to start something. Now we have a lot of physicians on this show and on my blog 
who talk about making that transition into the entrepreneurial role or into an industry role. So you've made that journey. So what would you say is your number one tip for these physicians interested in making that same transition? In some ways it's, you know, there's always a grass is greener thing that people can get caught up in. So it's really getting a good sense of your own self and the values that are most important to you. And you have to align, I, I really feel like you have to align your, your personal values to the work you're doing because you're spending most of your waking life in your job. Mm -hmm. And so for some people, it's th that moment with that patient at that bedside, that's the magical moment. And that's a hard one because you may not get that in some of these roles. For me, it was, I, I felt this pressure. I had it, you know, I wanted to change the world. I wanted to do something there. And it was the recognition of how important that was, the recognition of a bunch of these other values that were really important to me. That then it let me know that this was the right decision. It gave me a lot of clarity that it's not just, oh, that looks really interesting over there. Wow, that really aligns well with what I want. I have to tolerate the risk. Mm -hmm. Most of these are not successful, but I just I jumped into it because it just made so much sense for me. And I think that's the thing is it, it's such a change. And sometimes it looks cool because it's on the other side, but it's really good at getting a good sense of what moves you and gets you super excited in the morning. Sure. And that's, I think, a good reason to make a big change. It's just that self, self-awareness. All right. Let's transition into the Kevin Indy article that you wrote. It's titled, Diabetes Impacts the Whole Body, But the Foot Can't Be Forgotten. Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read your article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? Well, in, in many ways, I think... You know, we, we see diabetes costs an enormous amount of, of direct expenditures in the U.S. healthcare system, as much as I think north of three hundred billion. And what isn't well recognized is that it was a New England Journal article that came out like sixteen or seventeen. I first called it out. About a third of the cost of diabetes was linked to complications of the lower extremity. You, you only manage what you measure, and so for health plans, you know they know exactly what they're spending on hypertension because there's a couple of codes easy to measure. You know exactly what you're spending on heart failure. For diabetic foot, there's about 200 codes that make it up. Like they, when ICD-10 hit, they had so much granularity to give, like not only is it like the right, this digit, like, so if you don't know that that's the code set, you have no idea what you're expending on this. Mm -hmm. And it blows pairs away when we finally, if we can give them the codes, they realize, wow, how much we're spending here. So a lot of it is, it's just the recognition. Here's, this is something that causes so much suffering. And it's actually, it's, I, I believe it's a, a, a marker of, of poor quality care if you're in an area that has a lot of amputations, because it usually means we weren't getting our best preventative care to this patient. We're resulting all the way to the final step. Let's lose the limb. I think it was just very important to, to raise the awareness of something that drives, you know, it, it's got twice the five-year mortality of all pooled cancer in the United States, and that the cost of diabetic foot is probably half of all cancer in the United States. It, it's this massive juggernaut, and it isn't well appreciated. Largely because I think of this issue that it's, you manage what you measure. So it doesn't get the fanfare of some of these other conditions. So for those people who aren't familiar with the effect of diabetes has on the foot, give us a sense of the range of complications that one may see. And uh, also give us a range of why there are 200 ICD-10 <laughs> codes that could describe the various permutations of a diabetic foot. They really wanted the granularity, probably because like maybe better research. Actually, I don't know why we saw this explosion of codes. It, in some ways, yes, we lose our ability to really track when we go for simplicity, but simplicity can be addressed. It can be managed. And so we, we lost that battle a little bit in, in 10. So yeah, diabetes is a number of things. Right? It, it, it affects high glucose is toxic to a number of things like nerves. It's atherosclerosis is affecting the blood flow, especially at the small vessels. We get very bad blood flow. So it impedes like your wound healing. It impedes a number of things. If you have a history of smoking, it's that much worse. So what ends up happening is a perfect storm. So if they have, let's say a, a patient who's got long-standing diabetes, a fair amount of neuropathy, they wear a poorly fitted shoe, for example, and they start to get a friction injury breaking down the tissue on their foot. Now they often won't feel that if at all. I've seen patients come in, you probably have as well. You might have a tack or something they may have stepped on. They've been there for a while. They, they've lost that alarm system that says something's there. Because they have impaired wound healing, it can often, the, the injury mechanism kind of overwhelm the healing mechanism. It can start to break down to a, a wound. And because sugar is an amazing media for bacteria and bad bugs too, like mucor, like some really tough to treat bugs, you get this 
perfect storm for an infected wound with bad blood flow to the area. And now if you catch it too late, which is the way healthcare system typically, that's, that's considered you know, no, the most commonly done practice, you would see me in the operating room, unfortunately, right? Now we have to get rid of the diseased tissue, the, the poorly perfused tissue. And you know, by then it's just, it's too late. It's, it's, a, it's a devastating complication. Five-year mortality in the VA, which is, we spend a lot of time, is as high as 70%. After one of these amputations, it drives enormous costs, enormous amounts of mortality, and, and yet again, the marketing for it, it hasn't been that that great. So as a primary care internal medicine physician, we are trained to check the feet of all of our diabetic patients every three to six months. We do peripheral nerve tests and we do inspection, of course, but tell us what are some of the, the current ways that we should be monitoring diabetics and make sure they don't have any foot complications? Well... You know, when we work with pairs and we can see how often that code comes up, do they do the foot exam? And that's not necessarily tracking what actually happens. It is not as well coded as we would hope. Oh, the hope is actually maybe they're not coding some of those that work, but probably step one is we need to make that the patients to the best that they can can do a foot exam on their own mm -hmm. and that the best our clinicians can to make sure to remember to take off the socks and just get an eye on the foot. Now, those things, things will help. A problem though is, is the patient's going to be the first time he's going to notice something. Like if there's something happening, they're the ones in the day that can hopefully see it. But remember, they have diabetic retinopathy. They have poor range of motion, often morbidly obese. So that just to expect that, that that's going to be the best line of defense is probably, it's, it's a poor assumption. Nothing on, on, on this patient. They're often over, also overwhelmed by their care from the number of medications they need to do. It's, it's a lot that's happening with this patient. So you know, we, we need to find ways to, to augment the system that are trying to find things earlier. Systems like ours, and I'll try to keep generic because there's a number of wonderful solutions out there, but idea of, of can we know the moment we see tissue breakdown when it's still deep to the surface, so there isn't anything that's broken open, nothing to get infected yet. And if we know that moment, can we then do simple things like have them briefly walk less? Can we have them see a clinician at that moment when maybe it's still just a blister and then try to get care to them early. That's really where, where we or companies like us want to serve is, is a, a good early warning system that just says, hey, you know, why don't we get eyes on this patient at this moment? Often in between visits by a lot of time. And then the clinician can do whatever they think is the right thing. We're not here to, to, to help in, inform care other than to say, this is the time to take a look at this patient. So give us a story or a case study of either your product or products similar to yours and how would that um, be included in a typical patient workflow and how can that better monitor their feed and alert the physician for any problems? Uh, it's tough to pull them all out to a singular, but I'll give you an example of what a typical one would happen. For our company, we're, we're specifically targeting patients with usually poor access to care. It disproportionately affects minority patient populations, populations where we often see tech literacy gaps, health literacy gaps. We have a lot of work to do to help these very vulnerable patient populations stay on their own two feet. We'll try, we'll get into their home. Our system is, is in cellular enabled. So you don't have to worry about a smartphone or Wi-Fi. We, we wanted to make sure that that, you know, for example, if, if my, if, if you know, dad gets a Wi-Fi error, I know that often it'll just keep blinking and because he often won't be able to really organize to figure out what, what's causing this error. So we had to eliminate those, those sorts of steps. And then we just asked them to step on it for 20 seconds a day. And I, coincidentally, this, this is one of my old thermograms from probably five years ago, six mm -hmm. years ago. It'll generate an image like this which allows us to look for tissue breakdown. The body responds with an inflammatory response. We're looking for that hot spot that's there. And if we see it, it's typically about five weeks before the wound presents. So often the way the boring story goes, which is the one you want, is you see a hot spot, we have them walk last off, load it. And if that doesn't work, send them to see the clinician. And then ideally, that's it. Nothing else has to happen. Unfortunately, it doesn't always, you know, we're not going to catch everyone. So we'll still see, uh, even with best systems like ours and others, sensitivity isn't always 100%. So we will miss some. Ideally, we catch them still early enough to do something about it. And then with that, you try to prevent the big amputations, the real cost associated with it, which again, I'm happy to talk about. I don't want to make this necessarily a, a big promotional spot, but we've, we have now wonderful data looking at amputation reduction. And then importantly, I think our sy systems like ours need to show impacts on resource utilization. Are these cost-effective and ideally saving a significant amount more than the system generates in, in, in cost, uh, you know, hospitalization rate, ER rates, and outpatient visit rates. So why don't you go ahead and talk a little bit about the data? So tell me about how 
much improvement we get in amputation rates when we use these monitoring systems? Well, right now, data suggests we prevent around 71% of amputations from occurring in, in these complex patient cohorts. In the one study we did with Kaiser Permanente, 60% had chronic renal failure, high rates of heart failure. This is a very complex patient. We saw a similar 71% reduction and we complete elimination of major amputations. So thankfully, while we were with the system, no one lost, no more than a TMA on a patient. We saw a 52% reduction in all-cause hospitalization. That one's the interesting one because it ties back to the paper. I'll go back to that one in a second. A 40% reduction in all-cause ER visits and a 26% reduction in all-cause outpatient visits. That results in about a 12 thousand dollars savings per patient per year on average, including our users and our non-users. So the key of those, we had very, very high engagement. We see that those, con those numbers are fairly consistent account to account. It's a fairly, it's a strong savings for a patient that typically hasn't found a way to interact with the healthcare system very effectively. The hospitalization one was interesting though. We were, um, the, the top four DRG, only half of the hospitalizations we prevented were diabetic foot related. The other half, the top four DRGs, and, and I don't remember the relative order, but it was, uh, CHF exacerbation, COPD exacerbation, myocardial infarction, and stroke. So we want to understand why is that the case? Now, some of them are probably causal. So the paper that we put out that we, we had, not on our technology, just trying to understand the problem that we wrote about on Kevin MD was the idea that you have this massive inflammatory bomb that happens in your foot, often causing you know, bacteremia, sepsis. I mean, it is a massive thing that causes a, a, a huge spike in hospitalization. I believe it's a you're three times more likely to, to be hospitalized and you're 50% more likely to, to, to have mortality during this episode. And because of that, you know, you're having higher rates of heart attacks, stroke, these hypercoagulable states. Now, some things like CHF and COPD exacerbation, there's other reasons there too, while we're, we're driving that, but it's just making sure that we, we are aware of that link. If we can prevent that inflammatory cascade in that foot, we can have often, you, you might not recognize why it might affect something disparate from the foot but it has a fairly significant impact on the patient that needs a lot of care. So we have a patient take one of the tests on your devices and they show that their feet is having some type of inflammatory response. And is the next step then sending that result to the clinician to better manage their diabetes or potentially send them to a podiatrist? Are those generally the next steps if they see a tremendous amount of inflammation through your study? Yeah. So what we'll do for our, our patients, we give them a mat that's in their home and they just step on it daily. We ask about 20 seconds a day to step on it. And then they go on with the rest of their life. We then have a team of, of nurses that are tracking the data. And if we see a, a deviation, if you, you trip protocol, we'll notify that clinician to let them know this Mr. James, for example, uh, made up name is now in, in protocol. And then we just follow the protocol that we pre-arranged with that clinician. So still for the clinician, we're trying to minimize the impact on their practice. We've notified this is a patient that's an increased risk. We're running the instructions that they set. And if that doesn't work, we would then escalate to be seen by the clinician. And usually we're able to prevent around roughly two thirds of these hotspots from proceeding any further just by doing telephonic offloading. But for that one third, they do need to be seen. And about 76% of those patients have something that needs to get done. So it's usually we send them to the podiatrist because typically it's callous debridement. It's like a a hard rock everywhere you go, it's destroying mm -hmm. the tissue below. You just got to debris the callus or if it's a blister or potentially it's a 1A ulcer already that's occurred. You just want to get eyes on it that the moment that it's there and take care of it. That's the basic workflow for it. We're talking to John Bloom. He is an anesthesiologist and a healthcare executive. He wrote the Kevin MD article, diabetes impacts the whole body, but the foot can't be forgotten. John, what are some of your take home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? Well, for one, I, I, I think this, you, you only manage what you measure. That's a powerful thing. And most systems, health systems, health plans aren't necessarily aware that this is a big driver of costs until they run those codes. Mm -hmm. Those are out there in the published literature. If, if, if this is a, if you're running a health system, it's worth being aware of what's driving those costs. It isn't just buried into diabetes costs. There's often very specific drivers for it that are manageable. That if not managed, it's unmanaged. Two is that for patients who are very complex, these are very vulnerable patients. And I think we have to continue to recognize that they will often have health literacy gaps, tech literacy gaps, and can often be overwhelmed. You know, when I, when I practice or when I train, we, we called it the poorly compliant patient, which, which was always, you know, I labeled this patient as they're not complying with my will, right? I'm saying, you take this med, but they're not. 
And we don't often realize is that they can't always afford that medicine. There's often a lot more that's there. And that label, I think, actually can be destructive as opposed to helpful for us as we identify how to best help this patient. So I think those recognizing the extra social system, um, issues that may be around this patient gives us an ability to affect the, the actual underlying problems in many cases. John, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the time.